Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansing. Tonight, Canada records its highest temperature ever again. Public safety dangers in BC and no relief in sight. Do I stay in my, hot, in my apartment and pass out and have nobody know? Why it's being called a once in a lifetime event. I'm Andrew Chang. Also tonight, a Canadian doctor helping search teams at that collapsed condo and they're meeting with families of the missing. It was difficult, but again, that just makes us more determined. Black business owners question a government loan program for them. And I couldn't find anything in regards to like repayment terms. And crowds, COVID and the Stanley Cup. How will Montreal watch and cheer? This is The National. And this is Vancouver, a city baking yet again tonight in a record smashing heat wave, one that's being called not just historic, but dangerous. I'm on Granville Island tonight, which for those of you not familiar with Vancouver is just across from the city center. It is hot here, but about three hours northeast in the community of Lytton, hot made history again today. It hit 47 degrees Celsius. That set an all time Canadian heat record and that's happened for a second straight day. No matter where you are in Western Canada right now, it is very hard to escape the heat. Warnings are out for BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Yukon, and Northwest Territories tonight. BC has been in this heat wave for days now, and Katie Nicholson uh, joins me here on Granville Island. You are out and about in the city, and uh, how are people coping? Well, you know, the air is thick. It's making it hard to breathe. Uh, the more people I spoke to are not sleeping through the night because they're so uncomfortable. They're lethargic. They're tired, and people really just want this to end. It's really warm. It's really warm. The McAfee's thought they could escape the worst of the heat wave in Kelowna by coming to Vancouver. We figured it might be cooler down here. <laughs> but there's little relief, even near the coast. Can't kind of, you can't get cool. On Sunday, BC shattered 60 heat records. By Monday afternoon, more than 50 and counting. Only 40% of homes here have air conditioning. I couldn't hardly get any sleep last night. <laughs> no shirts, no pants off. That's uh, basically our life right now. And if it's that bad in Vancouver, it's worse further inland. Like Abbotsford, where it felt like 50 degrees with the humidity. Community groups offer some relief. Do I stay in my, in my apartment and pass out and have nobody know? Or do I come out here and breathe the air? and it be in the heat, it's like a catch 22. You don't really know what to do. 87 year old Jack Gibson has Alzheimer's. His Langley care home doesn't have air conditioning. That worries his daughter. I think any child to see their parent in a situation where there's any form of discomfort is not a comfortable situation by any means. Staff are doing their best to help residents, she says taking uh, tea towels, putting them in the freezer and using those to try and cool them down. The sweltering conditions forced schools and some businesses to close. Our kitchen is stifling. We can't let our kitchen staff operate in this weather. Others struggled to meet the skyrocketing demand for air conditioners and fans. We had 159 fans show up today and they're basically gone. In Victoria, the punishing heat buckled sidewalks while near Pemberton, rapidly melting mountain snow prompted flood watches. All as hospital ERs filled with cases of heat exhaustion. It's clear these temperatures aren't fit for man nor beast. Boy, it is uh, so different here than what I've seen over the many years that I've, I've lived here. It's not just the temperature records, Katie, that are being broken, but energy consumption, at least by kind of a summer perspective, those records as well. Yeah, it seems every day of this heat wave, Ian, we get a, a new note from BC Hydro saying we smashed the previous summertime energy consumption record. Last night, we did it again because it was so hot. Anyone who had an air conditioning unit had it cranked up. Uh, and, you know, we are fully expecting to again shatter that record today. And we just found out that Alberta is also shattering its summertime energy consumption records. No big surprise as the system moves further inland. All right, Katie, thank you. You're welcome. As we've said, this heat isn't just a BC problem. In Calgary, demand for air conditioners is soaring. This company got 250 calls just on the weekend. 
that's four times as much as what we typically see, especially in June. Units are flying off store shelves too, for Albertans and for their friends. I am not affected by the shortage, but people in Vancouver are, and that's why I'm buying some for Vancouver people and shipping it there. With heat warnings stretching from the U.S. west and southwest right into Manitoba and the north, emergency services are bracing for calls and offering this advice. Stay hydrated, use sunscreen, wear a hat, and uh, as well to just be really, really careful of kids and pets inside of vehicles again. Let's bring in CBC meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff and Johanna Lytton, British Columbia, breaking the all-time Canadian heat record yesterday. That was stunning enough. And then it happened again today. Un unbelievable, Ian. Uh, and we're, we've surpassed the 47 degree mark. We're going to have to wait sort of uh, till tomorrow morning to get those officials num official numbers in. But I remember uh, late last week thinking I was pretty bold looking at the forecast and saying we might hit 50 humidex across southern BC. Uh, we did that in many locations today, and now we're getting close to 50 degree temperatures. Just unbelievable. Uh, we hit uh, 40 degrees in downtown Victoria, 50 humidex in uh, Abbotsford in the Fraser Valley, and dozens and dozens of uh, daily and all-time British Columbia records falling again today. This was the peak of the heat for uh, Metro Vancouver, and boy, we could really use some relief uh, in the overnights. Our overnights on the south coast have been warmer than our usual afternoon highs. Just incredible stuff. And obviously, uh, climate change connection here. Uh, but I think right now, we've got to get through the heat dome first. I think I asked you this question on Friday. I certainly asked you last night, but I'm going to ask you again. Any sense when we might get some relief? Yeah, we, we really need that marine push. And as you and I know, Ian, after any sort of heat event, we get this classic cold front that cools us down. We are not getting that. So slightly cooler tomorrow. We're talking high 30s. The same temperatures that Toronto is under a heat warning for tonight will be our cool down tomorrow. So still very much a heat dome situation. It's just the heart of it is shifting towards the interior and through Alberta and Saskatchewan. Also seeing uh, this story through tomorrow. Long, long range. We might have to wake through next week. Uh, I don't see any big cool down as far as my models can go with any confidence. That's 10 plus days, Ian. As always, nice to have you on the show, Joe. Thank you. You're welcome. 10 plus days, Andrew. I was hoping Johanna would give us a better forecast in terms of cooler weather sooner, but it looks like this is here to stay for a while anyway. Oh gosh, I, I feel for you, my friend. Um, and, and you know, I know that, that they're really hot spots in BC as Joe was just mentioning, but, but how are things just right where you are? Yeah, I mean, it's really hard to convey, although in Katie's piece, you saw a lot of the hardship that people are dealing with. Uh, tonight in Vancouver, the evening humidex high is around 37 degrees, but we're under a canopy, a little bit of breeze off False Creek on Granville Island, so it's not bad. We're taking the kinds of precautions that doctors say we ought to take, and Andrew will be back later with an ER doctor to talk about those kinds of things. Andrew? Okay, sounds good. Uh, stay safe. Ian, thank you. Well, here's a look at the scene tonight in Florida near Miami. Search and rescue teams still working around the clock at the site of that condo collapse. Two more bodies were recovered today, bringing the official death toll to 11. But many more, including four Canadians, are still unaccounted for. Katie Simpson is on the scene near Miami now. So, Katie, what's the latest from the collapse site? Andrew, the rain has finally let up here, making conditions a little less dangerous as this relentless search and rescue mission pushes on another day. Photos of the missing line the fence of a tennis court at a growing memorial about a block from the condo collapse site. All hope is not lost here. This remains a search and rescue mission, even as the operation stretches into its fifth day. There are certain areas that we have not gotten to, but we've been able to place cameras that seem to have large enough spaces, voids, that occupants may still be in there. Special teams from Mexico and Israel are on the ground helping with the effort, and they recognize time is not on their side. It's become more and more challenge to find the people, but, you know, we, we are praying all the time. I have a faith in God, and I feel like... He paid me back. He gave me a second chance of life. Moshi Candiotti is grateful to be alive. He walked to his synagogue today to drop off a check, a donation to help with relief efforts after he barely escaped from his fourth floor condo unit. 
I felt the floor shaking, the, my bed was shaking. I got up, I got worse a little bit. Then I went to the balcony, I see a lot of fog, no fog, smoke and debris. Dr. Howard Lieberman wishes there were more stories of survival. He's a trauma surgeon with the Miami-Dade Search and Rescue Team. He's also Canadian, originally from Montreal. I'm all about urgency. I'm all about seconds, minutes, doing an intervention, hopefully saving someone's life. And here I am, been here since Thursday afternoon, and I have to just watch. And my skills aren't being you know, used um, really in the way that I, you know, I want to use them. Lieberman was at the site yesterday for the emotional in-person visits made by families of the missing to the search and rescue mission. You see faces, people, um, it really touches home. You see people screaming out for their loved ones. It, um, it was difficult. Um, but again, that just makes us more determined, uh, makes us, you know, just keep on going at it even that much harder. With that determination, Dr. Lieberman heads back to his post, desperately hoping his life-saving services may finally be needed. So Katie, a terribly challenging situation there. Is there any update on the four missing Canadians? I just checked in with a government source and I'm told there's no new information about those four missing Canadians. Some of their family members have flown here to Florida. They're getting support and hopefully new information from local officials on the ground here. But at this time, there's no update on the whereabouts of those missing four Canadians. No news to report there. Okay, Katie Simpson near Miami. Thank you. Well, a military investigation has found that a software glitch paid, played a major role in a Canadian Navy helicopter crash. The Cyclone helicopter went down off the coast of Greece in April of last year, killing all six people on board. The report says the pilot tried to manually override the flight control function, which was still in autopilot, but that conflict caused the aircraft to nosedive. The report recommends software fixes to the Cyclone's flight control system. Well, now to a CBC News exclusive. Ottawa's new Black Entrepreneurship Loan Fund aims to lower systemic barriers for the Black Canadian business community. But as Travis Danraj explains, members of that same community are now raising red flags. Cheryl Sutherland's business, a line of affirmation-inspiring goods, is all about optimism. But when she applied to Ottawa's Black Entrepreneurship Fund, doubts crept in. What is this performative allyship that we're seeing here? She is one of several black business owners who want answers about the almost $300 million loan program. I went through and I tried to uh, gather as much information as I could and I couldn't find anything in regards to like repayment terms. Questions too about the loan application, which asked about sexual orientation. Who actually put this question here together? To me it was very interesting. What else did they need from me, my blood type? The fund is managed by the Federation of African Canadian Economics. The organization known as FACE was only formed this year. Headquartered in Montreal, here in Justin Trudeau's riding of Papineau, it is an umbrella organization of black community-based groups. So we're glad to be a part of the co-design of a program that allows for us to serve our community. But there are concerns about how it won the contract. If it was open and public, either I'm very deaf Ryan Knight says his group wanted to bid to manage the fund, but never had a chance. You don't want the program to get demolished because due process wasn't, um, they didn't go through due process. And that's what happened with the WE scandal. And tackling systemic racism is not something that you simply do a request for the, the minister for. The minister responsible says the government did not seek out other organizations to manage the fund. I have confidence in FACE. They have been at the table for months, eight months, working with Canada's financial institutions. I feel like there's definitely levels of accountability that need to happen sooner rather than later. Cheryl Sutherland is waiting for a call about her application. Persistence, part of the territory as a black business owner in Canada. Travis Danraj, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, Federal Minister Catherine McKenna says she will not run in the next election and plans to leave politics. I just felt like I really do want to spend time with my kids. And I, uh, I really have other things I, I want to do on climate change. And, you know, I just, you know, it just felt right. The former Minister of Environment, now in charge of infrastructure, says she will, however, continue in her current role for as long as needed. 
Well, this next story about a teacher-student and coach-athlete relationship raises issues of power and vulnerability. A former teenage track star is speaking out today, decades after she says she was groomed and abused. Here's Julie Ireton with her story and her caution for others. Where's the start line? It depends on the race. So for the 3,000, it's over there. I think this... Mary Jane oh Richards gosh, set I'm records at this running it. track in the 90s. She was focused and fast. For close to seven years, she was coached one-on-one -on -one by Peter DeBrise. He was also her teacher at Bell High School in Ottawa. And he seemed to have this magic, magic touch, so to speak, that was turning me into this elite athlete. She says you know, he had control athlete. over her eating, and so sleeping, and social ago. life. I mean, I guess now they call it grooming. That's me right there. I think I was close to the beginning. The World Cross Country Championships in Spain in 1993. Richard says it was there her coach first touched her sexually. She was 16. And we kissed uh, once, and he was massaging me. Now it was without any, without any clothes on for me. Another athlete who competed in Spain remembers the closeness between Richards and De Brise. Maybe a couple of people were just saying, oh, I wonder what they're doing. I wonder what's going on with them. By her last year of high school, the two were having intercourse regularly. Another coach tells CBC he suspected something inappropriate was going on between Richards and DeBrise, and he spoke to DeBrise about it, but he never reported anything to authorities. Peter DeBrise has not been charged with any crimes. He did not respond to CBC's request for an interview. Richards says she never reported the abuse to police, only to the Ontario College of Teachers in 2019. But it has yet to hold a hearing on the matter. In an email to CBC, the regulatory body says, according to its rules, members who have a sexual relationship with their student, regardless of age and consent, are violating professional, ethical and legal parameters and it's considered sexual abuse. Richard says at 20, she had an emotional breakdown that led her to quit running. It's constantly on our radar. Education and sports organizations acknowledge they have to do more to prevent sexual abuse. The conversations that I'm having today about abuse in sport and what we need to do are vastly different from four years ago. That's little comfort to Richard. It's, it's a hard thing to shake. I think it's, and especially when it happens when you're so young, it almost becomes like a cornerstone of like your belief system. Her message now, if someone sees something inappropriate at school or in sport, they should say something. Julie Ireton, CBC News, Ottawa. And you can find a lot more of our investigation, including Mary Jane Richards' decision to quit the sport. Just head to cbcnews.ca. One legacy of the war against ISIS is the hundreds of militants and their families in detention camps in Syria. Those include dozens of Canadians. Now, a Canadian woman has been released from the camp. And as Margaret Evans explains, even though Ottawa says it had nothing to do with it, many say they should. This is what the woman in question has managed to leave behind. The bleak lines of a detention camp for ISIS families run by the Kurds in northeast Syria, still home to about 30 Canadians, most of them children. In March, she'd appealed to a former U.S. diplomat to help her get her four-year-old daughter out and to family in Canada. Now he's helped the mother as well. Before her release, Peter Galbraith made it clear he thought she should be helped home. And there are a number of women, including uh, at least one of the Canadians that uh, both you and I have talked to, who, who were quite clear that they knew they'd made a mis she knew she had made a mistake the moment she crossed into Syria. But her release raises questions about the fate of the Canadian women and children left behind and just who it is that's deciding it. Critics say Canada is in breach of its human rights obligations by abandoning citizens to arbitrary detention. Today, Global Affairs Canada issued a statement saying the government was not involved in securing the individual's exit from northeastern Syria, declining further comment. At the same time, at an Allies Against ISIS meeting, the U.S. urged governments to repatriate their foreign ISIS fighters from the Syrian camps. The larger group that uh, comprises uh, their um, family members, uh, women, children, uh, is also a significant uh, concern. Uh, and I think the, the strong message um, coming out of today's meeting was the need for 
uh, countries to do more. Canada's Foreign Minister Mark Garneau was at that meeting, but there's no indication, at least in public, that Ottawa is taking the message on board. Peter Galbraith says he's operating under his own initiative, but there will be questions for the Canadian government, no doubt. Who knew what, when, and what are the conditions for repatriating a citizen who's been accused of belonging to a terrorist organization? Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. Well, the pandemic is certainly complicating the playoff party for Habs fans. Up next, Montrealers get creative as the city grapples with how to keep crowds safe. As pride comes to an end, three Canadians who identify as non-binary share what that term means to them. I just can't wait for a world where we can just all be exactly who we are. And I'll be back from Vancouver with the health risks of this record-breaking heat. An ER doctor will join us with the symptoms to watch for. The National is back in two. Welcome back. Not many people saw it coming, but here we are. The Montreal Canadiens in their first Stanley Cup final since 1993. They lost game one tonight, but we'll bring the series home later this week. And along with the excitement that comes with that, an important question. During a pandemic, how do Montrealers cheer safely together? Allison Northcott has a look. Quebecers are finding ways to watch the playoffs together, despite pandemic restrictions on home game attendance. Really exciting, game one. These neighbours have a new ritual for most of the playoff games, watching together in the alley. Diving everyone outside, playoff is kind of an exciting moment. Excitement exploded last week outside Montreal's Bell Centre when the Habs clinched their spot in the finals. But after all that joy, a warning from public health officials urging fans to celebrate in smaller groups. Montreal Mayor Valerie Plante says she's trying to organize outdoor viewing parties but needs public health approval, which has been complicated because it's hard to ensure crowd sizes and distancing. Quebec's health ministry says it has a duty to remind people the pandemic isn't over, despite how badly Canadians fans want to get together to support their team. Health officials are looking at the city's requests. Current rules allow 3,500 fans inside the Bell Centre, which could allow for a viewing party with screens showing Wednesday's game from Florida. But some have made their own plans, like showing the games on giant screens in their yards or setting up in parks like this one. People have been like really hungry for any form of like social social event or interaction, and we look to attract those people because we share, you know, the excitement together. Put a TV on the back of the tree so they can sit on that part so they can be there six feet away. At this cafe, it's Euro Cup soccer during the day and hockey at night. When we first initially started, it was just for among friends and family and then it grew into a, a real crowd. He says it's good for business but the crowds can be hard to control and he'd like Montrealers to have more options. The mayor says she's hoping for that in time for the first home game on Friday. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Well, one of the world's top tennis events also kicked off today. Wimbledon returned one year after the pandemic forced its cancellation for the first time since the Second World War. Salima Shivji looks at what's being done to keep players and fans safe. The rain delay is very familiar, but this is not. A long queue not to buy tickets, but to show the proof needed to enter. A negative COVID-19 test or two shots of a vaccine. For this family, the hassle is more than worth it. It feels fairly safe. Everybody's sort of keeping the distance as well. So, yeah, we're just really excited to be here. We're really looking forward to the day. You know, the kids are, kids are really excited and we're pleased the event can go ahead. It's going ahead with half the usual capacity on the grounds and traditional treats eaten alone at a distance. There are plenty of things that will look different this year at Wimbledon, but not the finals. The plan is to have center court at full capacity. When you're sitting in those seats, you won't even have to wear one of these. It's a pilot plan approved by the UK government, even as new COVID cases fueled by the more contagious Delta variant are at the highest level since January. Just under half of the country is fully vaccinated. At tennis's hallowed ground, those in charge say the plan to reach full capacity could still change. We're starting off at 50% ground capacity and we have a plan to move forward. But if anyone's, anyone's got any concerns, we'll, we'll sit and talk about it. 
great defense. Still, it's only day one, and this looks normal, even as the pandemic makes itself felt. Britain's top female player was on a roll in the lead up to the championships and excited. For me, it's, it's just the opportunity to play in front of a home crowd. She won't get that chance now, forced to withdraw and isolate after close contact with a team member who tested positive. The players are in a fiercely protected bubble that they're still getting used to. I'm embracing it. Um, I'm OK with it. Um, yeah, it does feel totally different than the last 20 years here since I've been coming here. Uncertainty reigns and not just on the grass this year. Salima Shivji, CBC News, London. Well, Serena Williams will compete for her 24th Grand Slam title at Wimbledon this year, but she dropped something of a bombshell this weekend when she said she would not compete in Tokyo for the Olympics. Yeah, I'm actually not on the Olympic list, and if so, then I shouldn't be on it. Williams didn't give a specific reason, but she has previously expressed frustration over Olympic travel restrictions that would prevent her from bringing her three-year-old daughter. Canadian basketballer Kim Gauthier has also said she'd be staying home to breastfeed her infant daughter. We'll be right back from Vancouver, where it is dangerously hot tonight. Those record-breaking temperatures are expected to last a little longer. So next, an ER doctor joins us with how to stay safe. Welcome back to Vancouver's Granville Island. As we return to our top story tonight, the record-breaking heat gripping much of Western Canada. For the second day in a row, as you've heard, Lytton, British Columbia, setting a record for the highest temperature ever recorded in Canada, more than 47 degrees Celsius. I don't remember it being this hot this early before. From BC to Manitoba and into the territories, people are doing what they can to try to beat the heat. Splash pads, beaches, air conditioners and fans all are in high demand right now. Well, let's bring in Dr. Daniel Kalla, an emergency physician at St. Paul's Hospital here in Vancouver. You worked on the weekend and tell us the, the heat related cases that you saw. Yeah, more than ever before in my career this weekend and I was working night shifts and we saw lots of people come in with kind of a spectrum of symptoms over the weekend. So some of them heat stroke, that's dangerous. Yeah, so most of them came in with heat exhaustion, which is the earlier and more common form, nausea and lightheadedness and just feeling off. But a few of them were seriously ill with heat stroke and that's when the body's thermal regulatory system begins to shut down and they just get overwhelmed by temperature and high fevers. Lots of different cases, lots of different causes, but generally what sort of patterns were you seeing that was leading to those? Yeah, it was, you know, some people outside, but I'd say more people were stuck indoors in their condos that weren't air conditions. And despite doing all the right things with ventilation and fans and cold showers, they just couldn't control their body temperature and they were still getting sick. And older people, I guess, more prone to that. Yeah, that's the risk is people who are older, people who are on certain medications, substance users are really at high risk. Their thermoregulatory systems just don't work as well. And if they're impaired at all and don't recognize the early warning signs, they can get very sick. So for people here in Vancouver, but really all across Western Canada, dealing with unprecedented temperatures, at what point should you start worrying that, you know, yes, it's hot. Yes, you're feeling uncomfortable. But at what yeah. point does it get to like this could be dangerous? Yeah, I mean, that's true. No one feels comfortable in this heat. But if you start vomiting, which a lot of our patients were doing, if you start, you know, if, if you really are feeling lightheaded when you stand up or if you actually faint, which some of our patients were doing, and certainly symptoms like confusion, seizures, you know, muscle contractions, not putting out urine, if family members recognize another family member seems to be a bit confused or off, those are really important signs that they need active treatment, they need to come to hospital. And one last thing, it may not seem profound, but it is important, what are some of the basic precautions? Yeah, I mean, obviously there's all the motherhood, obvious stuff, stay out of the sun, wear light, cool clothing, um, but you know, if you are inside and you can't get yourself cool enough, cold showers do work, cold baths, and just spraying yourself with, with water and keeping your skin damp and moist and running a fan over will help. It's some of the methods we do in the emergency department to cool people. Dr. Kalla, ER doctor and novelist, thank you very much. Thanks, Ian. The precautions, the warning signs, all very important as this heat hangs on and shifts eastward. Alberta expected to be the hottest spot tomorrow with temperatures reaching the high 30s. 
That's it tonight from Vancouver. Andrew, back to you in Toronto. Okay, Ian. And when we come back, three Canadians who identify as non-binary on what that term means. I constantly get questioned when I'm getting on airplanes because my gender, whatever that is, doesn't match my presentation, whatever that is. Why their experiences should make us all think about who we are and how we see For others. Me, Well, a big legal victory today for a transgender student in the United States. Gavin Grimm had been forbidden from using the boys' bathroom in his Virginia high school after he began identifying as male. The school forced him to use a separate single stall room. A federal court ruled that violated his rights, and today the U.S. Supreme Court let that decision stand. Now, with Pride celebrations ongoing, it is a good time to reflect. Last month, singer-songwriter Demi Lovato revealed that they now identify as non-binary, joining other well-known artists who have made similar declarations. But what does that term actually mean? Well, according to LGBTQ plus advocacy groups, non-binary is a term for people who live outside the categories of male or female. But even then, it's not so simple. Tonight, as we near the end of Pride Month, we speak with three Canadians about their experience identifying as non-binary, the comfort that comes with that sense of self, and why, for them, in a very important way, the whole idea of gender is something of a non-issue. <laughs> how much of my life was a gender performance, a performance of, like, femininity. I mean, can you just start by telling me about yourself? I mean, who is Ariane Prasad? I, um, I was born and raised in Guyana. I lived there until I was 14. I think as a non-binary person, it doesn't always become this thing where it's like, and that was the day that I knew that I was this or that. For me, it's a series of different things that stand out. So one of those things is me getting my hair cut when I was really young, then all of a sudden it was like kind of chopped short. Um, and my mom insisted that I wear earrings. I understood it was more important for me to wear the earrings. So my mom didn't have to say, this is a girl when someone was like, oh, your little boy is so cute. But it was very much like, I, I don't understand. I don't understand why it needs to be clear to someone else that I'm this thing when I very much don't feel, um, I don't feel the same. Like I, I sort of felt like the only honest way I could do an interview like this was to ask a lot of these important questions of myself. But why do I so readily accept the idea that I am male? I honestly couldn't come up with a very satisfying answer beyond the, the obvious, which is I was born with male parts. But I'd be at a loss to explain to you what sort of inside me intrinsically makes me feel male. Yeah, I, I love that because I feel like there is still, I sometimes feel compelled to describe non-binary almost the same way. And I feel like that is what I want for myself and for like other non-binary people is to feel that you don't have to necessarily question like, why am I okay with, with this, right? Because if you feel the way you feel up until you don't, awesome. If you imagine like an iceberg, and every time someone uses the wrong pronoun, there's like a little chip. It's just like a little nick. You know, I struggle because there are still people who don't understand Hey, Faith, can you start just by introducing yourself? My name is Faith Wendall. I use they and them pronouns, and uh, I'm privileged to work as the afternoon radio host here in Winnipeg, the heart of the country. Who is Faith Wendall has changed so much. I mean, I was born Wilfred Faith Ramelow Fundal, and then not long ago realized that my gender identity, what I had known uh, about myself, just didn't feel right. Figured out that non-binary was a gender identity that, that worked for me because it felt right. And now I'm just Faith Wendell. When I, when I first heard this term was, is this sort of a recognition that gender is a spectrum where you have male and female on either end and that people exist can exist on multiple parts of that spectrum? Or is it a rejection 
of that spectrum altogether, right? I'm not sure if we'll actually ever have an answer to that question, right? Because it is, I think, all of those things. I, I've met online folks who um, don't believe, don't, don't identify within anywhere in that spectrum. So I, I think it's all of that. <laughs> now there are more layers to it. There is your sex or uh, the, the body parts that you have when you were born, um, one or the other, um, or both. Um, and then there's the, the gender identity, how I feel. Um, so that could include non-binary, which is something for me, that's, that's what feels right and that, 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 that is for me. Then of course there's the gender expression, you know, I'm sitting here in this beautiful weather here in, in Winnipeg and I'm wearing this, whatever this color is, you know, my gender expression in this moment is very feminine. So it, it yeah, it changes. I, I, I had all those layers because it is such a layered thing. My name is Ivan Coyote. I'm a writer and a storyteller. I was born and raised in Whitehorse, Yukon Territory. What else can I tell you about myself? Um, well, I'm a really good cook, nothing fancy, like I'm just really good at comfort food. You can ask my neighbor, I just brought her some stew. And uh, I'm a non-binary trans person. Yeah, I pretty much feel like most days it's the one of the least interesting things I have to talk about. So I basically spent like my childhood being pretty fundamentally convinced that I was a unicorn um, and feeling pretty fundamentally sort of alone in the world as a kid. I guess maybe nine years ago, uh, I first heard that term non-binary. I wasn't drawn to it at first uh, because it felt to me like it wasn't really an identity, it was like a non-identity. Like it wasn't saying I am this, it was saying I am not that. I am non-binary. So I sort of bent the corners of it to fit, I guess, you know? But now I'm okay with that word, non-binary. Um, it's not perfect, but until we invent a better one, yeah, it'll do. What is it that you want or expect from people? Because a lot of folks out there who genuinely want to understand what it means to be non-binary, but they also don't know how to then react to it. I expect uh, respect. I expect to be treated with respect, just like I guess we all hope for, you know? I, I constantly get questioned when I'm getting on airplanes because my gender, whatever that is, doesn't match my presentation, whatever that is. And think about all the times that you have to check M or F on a box and then ask yourself how many of the times that information or that data is actually necessary, because most of the time it's not. Are there people that you don't have this conversation with? I honestly haven't talked to my, to my like, parents that raised me about it. Do, do you think they would understand? I think they would, yeah. I, I know that they would, even though I'm terrified because I'm like, oh, what are they going to say? I think they will accept it. <laughs> I'm non-binary, but what exactly does that mean? We'll answer some of the gender questions you've always wanted to ask in our new podcast, They and Us. How difficult is it for you to try to come to some, you know, coherent understanding about yourself and how you feel, but to do it in, in such a public way with so many people watching you do it? Um, I care very much about helping people understand using they pronouns and got stuck in this vicious spiral of this is not going to end well but somehow I wanted to keep having the conversation um, it, it, it's, it's hard we can't change the world overnight for our children we can't change transphobic minds overnight like, I don't think that the gender binary just hurts non-binary people or trans people. I think it hurts all of us. Let's just all just be our authentic selves. I just can't wait for a world where we can just all be exactly who we are without this threat of, like, constantly having to police our own genders. And, I mean, that's, I think, the gift that trans and non-binary people bring to the world. That was great. Okay, Thank thanks, so Andrew. Much, eh? Peace out. I guess, yeah, I better, I better go back on air. Uh, thank you. Take care. Cheers. Thank you for having me. And yeah, it was lovely. Thank you. So, all right. um, so hey, the, the warmest 
genuinely, the warmest of thank yous uh, to all three of those folks, Ariane, Faith, and Ivan, uh, for sharing so openly and so kindly and so generously. I hope you, you at home found that uh, conversation, even just a sliver, as, as insightful and helpful uh, as I did. Okay, up next, a tribute to a woman who spent decades fighting discrimination in this country. I wanted the doodle to show her prominence. You know, the impact of the, the, the work she did, it took her entire life. The legacy behind the doodle right after the break. Welcome back. Mary Two Acts Early may not be a name you recognize, but for Indigenous women in Canada, she was a trailblazer who fought for their rights. Today, her legacy was recognized and on display for millions to see online. Geneseo Deer of our CBC Indigenous Unit spoke to the artist behind the tribute. I wanted the doodle to show her prominence, I guess, her, you know, the impact of the, the, the work she did. It took her entire life to accomplish this. This digital work tells the story of a Binyakahaga woman who changed Canada. Artist Star Horn says she's hoping today's Google Doodle will help raise awareness about the legacy of the late Mary Tuax Early, who spent her life fighting against gender discrimination in the Indian Act. I had a vision that I one day would be free again to be an Indian. I married a white man in 1938, and yet there's that law that you're not Indian anymore when you marry a non-Indian. For decades, First Nations women who married a non-status man were stripped of their Indian status, as were their children. A law can make your own brother discriminate against you, like he's Indian and you're not. But on this day in 1985, Bill C-31 was passed, reinstating her Indian status and that of thousands of others. Mary is just such an important figure in Canadian history. It's time that her story becomes more well known. Courtney Mator is a Ganyatkahaga filmmaker from the same community as Two Acts Early. She wrote and directed a documentary that dives into her life and legacy. Horn is also from Gahnawage. I wanted her family to be proud of it. I wanted them to to know how important she, she what she means to everybody. I wanted uh, I wanted people to know her impact. Advocates say that Two X Early's fight for Indigenous women's rights needs highlighting because it's not over yet. The National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls called for the elimination of lingering gender-based discrimination in the Indian Act. So it's so important that it's going to have this, you know, this reach across Canada that I just want more people to, to know her name and understand that this isn't something of the past. No doubt, Mary Two X Early would agree. Gonna see you, dear. CBC News, Gahnawage. Okay, up next, looking to rent? Well, all utilities are included in this property, and the landlords do mean all, including daily home-cooked gourmet meals. It's next in our moment. Well, Nathan Thomas and Shauna Bowen are new to the rental business, but their unique rental package includes a pretty delicious amenity. Daily chef-made gourmet meals. And now the New Brunswick couple is looking for the perfect tenant. Tonight, they're our moment. We've been renters for a while. We wanted to kind of break the mold with something that we know also well, and that's food. We were also interested in real estate and, you know, owning rental properties. So we decided to marry the two and kind of like your hotel experience but it's your everyday life we, we just decided hey we're going to post this ad um and we're going to make sure that the focus is on food what we would like to do is first of all provide breakfast available every day also there'll be access to our limited stocked cabinets i'm the master chef i guess and he's my sous chef <laughs> um we both love cooking i might be a little bit <laughs> yeah, yeah. We love people, we love getting to know people. It's something that we would love to bring to as many people as possible. So this is really just a starting point, I would say for us. 
Well, they just seem like absolutely uh, wonderful people. And what a wonderful offer that, that seems like. Um, understandably, they are uh, busy. They're, they're in the process of screening applicants, is my understanding, because they do want to find that perfect fit. But I just love how, how genuinely excited uh, they seem. And the food looks incredible. That's The National for this June 28th. Hope you have a great night.